that in the month of September, our uh, one of our locations, the central location, is uh, starting the in-person services, and then uh, in October, the other locations will be starting off. So after having been, uh, you know, at home and worshiping online, really looking forward to that. Yeah, so it's good, all good. Yes, yes, Saran. Yes, good morning, good morning, Kiran. Um, so uh, we will pray and get started. Uh, and if you have a group um, for your class, it'll be nice if you can just put a reminder message. I think some of our friends are not yet here. Uh, so hopefully they too will join quickly. Uh, so let's pray and uh, we will begin. Arin, can you lead us in prayer today? Are you comfortable to pray, uh, Arun? OK. Oh, her mic is not working. OK, OK, sorry about that. Uh, OK. Um, how about Kiran? Kiran, can you please lead us in prayer? Yes, ma'am, sir. Yeah, thank you. Father God, we just come before one, once again your throne, Father God. Father God, thanking you for everything, Father God. Thanking you for one new uh, fresh day, Father God. Thanking you. Thanking you, Father God. Um, upcoming time, I'm just submitting to your hand, Father God. You just blessed to Nancy, my mother, blessed to each and every student, Father God. And those students willing to join, Father God, help them to join our classes, Father God. And reveal more revelation, Father God, and give your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we can understand our subject, Father God, and use your kingdom way, Father God. Thanking you for everything. Thank you, Father God. Almighty praise, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kiran, for leading in prayer. Uh, so we are studying from the book of Acts. And in the last class, we saw how Stephen stands before the council and he defends himself. Uh, and despite such a good defense, the very accusation against him that he was not honoring the holy place or the temple, that he was not honoring Moses, um, you know, all those claims that people had against him, he was able to demolish with his explanation. But still, the people were so enraged and angry with him, excuse me, that, uh, you know, they, they went ahead and they killed him. So uh, it was really heartbreaking to see how the uh, uh, you know how he became a martyr and the pain that Stephen endured. We saw that um, you know at the time when when Stephen was about to give up his life, he saw Jesus standing in appreciation uh, of his dedication and devotion to Christ, and you know Jesus was really welcoming him uh, with with honor into heaven uh, and you know what a beautiful beautiful uh, uh, way right for uh, a, a martyr to be accepted uh, in heaven so that was comforting you know even though we we saw that uh, uh, he was stoned and so brutally murdered uh, uh, and for being an innocent person okay uh, that that really breaks our heart but the lord jesus showed his compassion from heaven and appreciated Stephen. We saw that. And we also saw, you know, how the fruit of the spirit, after all this was, uh, you could say he was not really one of the apostles or one of the great leaders in the early church. Uh, but though he was by now only like a volunteer, you see him only as a volunteer who was selected to serve food uh, by the early church. But even a volunteer, right, uh, the, the kind of maturity that he had developed in God, the way he was moving, we uh, read that he was moving in powerful signs and wonders. Okay, So a man of good report, a man who was uh, uh, moving in the power of God and also a man with the fruit of the spirit, 
now think with me you know how many of us as believers will have the heart to say you know god please don't hold whatever they are doing to me don't hold it against them so unless you have the fruit of the spirit right love joy peace patience kindness goodness uh, uh, what self control the the fruit of the spirit uh, in the life of a believer not necessarily a leader so in the early church it really shows us you know how people were maturing in the lord and how they loved the lord even unto death and uh, stephen is is a is a martyr stephen is a, a martyr who went who gave up his life you know with 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 such a kind heart he trusted god even towards the end and he was willing to forgive the people who uh, murdered him so when you when we look at all these things it really moves us and, and it really helps us to see how the holy spirit was working in the lives of people uh, you know in the early church now we will continue from there so we've completed we've looked at the life of stephen and you know something like this can shake the church up okay uh, to have somebody who is such a good Uh, and a wonderful part of our church now that person was killed uh, through mobs and you know that can bring a lot of fear what will happen to the church will they continue to uh, hold on to god's word will they continue to preach the gospel what will happen to that acts 1:8 that jesus said now you go into all the world and preach the gospel will they stop because of something so uh, uh, you know something so terrible that has happened to the body but we notice that the believers don't stop they continue to take the gospel out you know different ones of them in their own capacities they serve the lord and that's the beauty of the the work of the spirit in the life of the believer okay uh, and uh, you know we we see throughout now even now after stephen died uh, that didn't stop the believers and you know they they were passionate about the kingdom of god so acts chapter 8 we will move on to the next chapter here uh, it's hard to move on because we've just had you know such a wonderful man of god uh, being killed you know in in this kind of a, like a painful heartless way uh, and it's really hard to to move on and talk about other things but uh, we we see that god's work did not stop right even after martyrdom of his beloved children uh, now verse from verse 1 of uh, acts chapter 8 uh, we see that saul okay saul uh, saul of tarsus remember uh, stephen was presenting the word of god to different uh, people from different synagogues okay wise men ed educated men from different synagogues and uh, he would uh, try to convince them and have disputes with them and sicilia we saw the term sicilia there so obviously uh, you know that's that's uh, uh, a notable place because saul of tarsus comes from that region and uh, rightly so acts chapter 8 you know you have saul uh, his name also is mentioned and you see that he was consenting to his death now when you look at that word consenting if you look it up in the greek word we are told that the actual greek word that is not just to say yes but with approval you know very happily uh, and uh, in a way that it pleases you you know you're saying yes go for it do it okay uh, so he was passionately saying yes to the death of stephen so you can imagine the condition of saul's heart at this point he was passionately against the church of the lord jesus christ and what kind of works was saul of tarsus involved in uh, we are told that you know there was a great persecution that um, uh, happened and you know it it uh, affected people in the in the church of jerusalem uh, and these people were scattered okay they they were scattered throughout the region of judea samaria uh, except the apostles so the believers got scattered the believers got scattered but the apostles remained 
now some of the other passages uh, about uh, paul that you read uh, in the book of philippians chapter 3 and verse 6 you know uh, paul writes about his way of persecuting those who believed in jesus and uh, he he says that with zeal with zeal he persecuted okay and uh, he was very very um, proud of his his association you know with with the uh, with the pharisees and you know you read he is describes himself in many places as you know he he was a pharisee of pharisees and uh, he he was living for the right thing whatever he was taught he was just being true to that teaching and he thought that uh, this new teaching about jesus is going to corrupt the law and that is why uh, as an act of righteousness you know he was uh, passionately against the church and at that time a great uh, persecution arose okay now what will happen if there is persecution and believers can no longer gather in that same place here we are told that they got scattered so what do we expect you know we might expect that believers are very scared now they uh, may want to forget about church uh, and not continue in the faith but that's not what happens in the book of acts in fact you find that the believers take that passionate devotion for christ wherever they go okay so uh, believers got scattered and they took the gospel with them and we will see we will see how this affects other regions okay as we go along now uh, continuing in chapter 8 verse 2 also says and devout men carried stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over oh, lamentation over him so in among the jews you had uh, excuse me people like uh, people like saul who were passionately against stephen but you also had people who were devoted to god okay and who could see right from wrong so there were some jews who understood that what was going on was not correct now these were the people who helped with the burial of stephen remember he was just thrown he was dragged outside the city and he was stoned so his body would have been lying there without anyone to claim it but there were some good people uh, who actually helped with the burial and it says they made great lamentation now in those times uh, there was also that culture of crying and grieving over uh, somebody who died so these good people knew uh, that you know they must give stephen that honor and they did it now we continue to see the manner in which saul is is uh, persecuting the church so in verse 3 Saul says, uh, "We we see that Saul made havoc of the church. You know, when you say that made havoc, um, it's it's like creating fear, creating chaos, creating a lot of confusion. So, very proactively, Saul of Tarsus was trying to damage the church. Okay, in every way possible. So, we read about him." he was entering every house that is to show that uh, he didn't want to spare anybody so he was entering every house dragging off men and women it says so you know when men uh, in in the times of uh, the early church if men were the ones who were um, persecuted that is understandable but if a persecutor was happy to persecute women also it really shows his extent of passion and zeal uh, for his own law and against the teachings of jesus so you know saul of tarsus you know it's painting a picture for us this is the man that we are going to see give his life to christ a, a little later on in fact in the very next chapter but this is how he is right now he is angry he is uh, you know uh, creating havoc he is consenting consenting with approval with great uh, happiness okay uh, to the persecution of the believers and 
he drags people out and we are told that he was committing them to the prison so he really wanted to uh, you know trouble those who were believers and uh, it says therefore those who were scattered were went everywhere preaching the word so when these kind of things are happening for their own safety the believers must have left jerusalem the apostles stayed on and that we see but believers went off to a safer place but you notice they went off and they didn't keep quiet we are told that they were preaching the word everywhere they went so uh in one sense we can see that the people had a genuine conversion they were uh, genuinely you know filled with the holy spirit and they were genuinely passionate about the gospel now the apostles didn't have to tell them you know five steps for evangelism you talk about jesus you pray you bring them to church nothing they got scattered it's a very fearful time okay they've run away but even though they have run away it says wherever they went they they knew about christ and they knew christ so well that they could not stop but share this truth with others so uh, it is said sometimes that uh, uh, these if you want to call them missionaries or you want to call the believers as uh, uh, preachers they were not in the ministry because they intended to be in the ministry you know so to speak but uh some people have said that they became accidental preachers so they went off to a new place and now you don't have your uh, pastor with you you don't have your apostle uh, you know peter and apostle john with you but people need to know about jesus so what what did these believers do they said okay fine let us only share about jesus and they would have uh, you know gone ahead and preached and people heard the gospel so this is the way the gospel spread outside of jerusalem so acts 1:8 is happening even though there is persecution remember gamaliel what he said when uh, uh, you know he uh, was talking to the council he said look this is if this is a work of god we cannot stop it and in the introduction of the book of acts i told you imagine it something like a forest fire and that is what is happening even when the people try to put a lid on it and how hard did the authorities try to stop the spread of the gospel you saw Saul of Tarsus it's quite bad because uh, you know he's dragging people putting them in the prison every house it says even the women so in a very very uh, serious way brutal way they were being harmed and yet the gospel did not stop okay so is it a work of god or is it not a work of god you know again it's very obvious that this is the work of god and the gospel is being taken to other regions so the way jesus said jerusalem judea samaria now judea samaria is happening and then the ends of the earth but the movement to the ends of the earth has started okay now we will read about one more volunteer whom we we uh, met in the uh, chapter 6 we you know when they needed uh, seven men so philip okay philip is is another volunteer in the church uh, and we'll see how he is ministering after this persecution and uh, you know fleeing away from the church so we are told here that philip he went down to the city of samaria now what was special about samaria you know the samaritans they were not they they were uh, sort of a mix some um, mix of the you know jewish culture and some other culture so they were not if you if you want to term it as you know the pure breed they say of jews hebrews they were not like that so they had a little bit of a mixture happening uh, in their blood so they were jews also but they had some other culture mixed up so the actual jews did not like the samaritans and they in fact looked down on the samaritans and yet you know philip as a believer uh, he doesn't he doesn't stop himself from ministering the word to a different culture 
and in this case uh, a culture of people who were pro who were considered lower than the culture from which philip came so he went to samaria and it says beautifully he preached christ to them and what was the result of the preaching of philip multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by philip so uh, the way peter stood up and preached people responded now a volunteer church he's just a church volunteer okay but these are all spiritual men it's not about their position in the church but you see how strong their relationship with god is okay so that is what is important and we can see that uh, philip had a strong relationship with god and how he went ahead and preached and uh, people actually responded to the gospel uh, and you see that there were miracles right that philip also did so they were in in no way you know god was not limiting himself to be seen only through the ministry of the apostles but god was seen very much in the ministry of the believers and the volunteers of the church also so today that's a big lesson for us isn't it that uh, we too can all believers in our church can be like a stephen they can be like a philip okay and god can work through everybody now while uh, philip was ministering you also notice that uh, unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city so what kind of ministry is philip engaging in you know it it is the way jesus ministered preaching teaching healing so speaking the gospel and demonstrating the power of the kingdom of god so he engaged in both ways and whenever the gospel is brought to a place what happens you see that at the bottom um, uh, of verse 8 it says and there was great joy in that city so when god his love the news that salvation has been already bought for us on the cross and you know his his power is released in the lives of the people we receive joy okay so the people receive joy that land receives joy and that is what ministry should do so you notice here the gospel is traveling it already happened in jerusalem people responded it has gone to samaria now and it is blessing the land of samaria so when we talk about you know missions and taking the gospel here taking the gospel there planting a church in a new city so out of that ministry what should happen so beautiful philip went and preached philip went and demonstrated the power of the kingdom there was great joy in the city so the gospel it brings great joy right to the people and that is the beauty of the gospel and over here i told you that the samaritans were uh, not considered you know uh, highly by the jews at all so even to a so called you know lower section of the people uh, the gospel went through the gospel touched their lives and god was not discriminating and here even a believer like philip who is a jew himself he was not discriminating okay uh, and the the gospel gave him an open mind because we know the bible says that you know god so loved the world so there is no sections and you know one is better than the other uh, all kinds of biases in our society in our community we see that but as far as the gospel is concerned you know god does not discriminate as believers we should not discriminate uh, you know when it comes to the different strata of society so beautifully philip ministers and there is great joy in the city now moving on now there are all kinds of people right in a given place uh, and the gospel has touched many lives we will read about a prominent person in samaria who was affected by the gospel and uh, this uh, man's name is simon 
Okay, this man's name is Simon. Uh, Simon was actually a sorcerer. Okay, so he was uh, indulging in black magic, witchcraft, you know, things of the, uh, uh, he was engaging in the, the dark spiritual realm. Okay, but we read about him that he was so effective and so powerful in the city that they used to call him the great power of God. Okay, uh, and when Simon saw what Philip was doing, he was astonished. Oh, sorry, just a moment. Uh, no, the people were astonished at the sorcery of uh, Philip. But also, we see that Simon was, again, astonished or amazed by the supernatural works that Philip did. Okay. So now you can imagine, now there's already a man who was moving in the wrong kind of uh, spiritual activities. Okay, And obviously, there was some power which he was seeing through uh, his work. But when Philip comes and he ministers through the power of God, uh, a sorcerer is amazed. So, the power of God was greater, much greater than whatever he had experienced in the practice of his witchcraft. You got it? Uh, and, and he's not like some ordinary uh, sorcerer because people used to call him the power of God. Somebody of his caliber, somebody who had the, the uh, city looking up to him, that kind of a person is amazed by the ministry of Philip. Okay, so this just shows us that a believer, and in this case, Philip is, he's not even an apostle, but God's power can flow mightily through the life of anyone who believes. Okay, that even a sorcerer was amazed. Those kind of miracles, we saw that miracles, people were set free, those who were paralyzed were healed. Wow! Supernatural demonstration of the power of God happening through the life of an ordinary believer. That even a sorcerer is amazed. And that is happening in the city of Samaria. So, uh, Philip is continuing his ministry. So what are all the things that he did? He preached there. We are told that uh, he preached about the kingdom of God. He preached uh, about the name of Jesus. And both men and women, they were baptized. Then this man, Simon, seeing all this, hearing everything, he also responded. Okay, how beautiful. And he continued with Philip, it says. That means, uh, obviously, there must have been uh, more meetings like this, prayer meetings, gatherings, where people used to worship together. So Simon decided, okay, let me also go. Let me also learn more things. Let me also worship this God. So he became a believer. Okay, then uh, when all this amazing work is going on in the uh, city of Samaria, the apostles were in Jerusalem. They heard uh, that people had responded to the word of God in Samaria. So what did they do? They sent Peter and John to them. So the apostle Peter, the apostle John from Jerusalem, they come to Samaria uh, and they minister to the people of Samaria uh, the Holy Spirit baptism. Okay, so now you might you might ask the question: Is it a different um, incident to be baptized in the Holy Spirit compared to being born again? Because being born again uh, is also a work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we do receive the Spirit uh, in a you know in, in there is a work of the Spirit when we are born again, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate incident. We already said that when Philip preached the gospel, many people responded. And even the apostles heard that the word of God was received. That means people have already become believers. Now, when they have already become believers, they are once again ministered to, uh, to receive the baptism in the 
Holy Spirit. So in the early church, it's becoming quite clear that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate experience from being born again. And Peter and John, they go to Samaria and they help. So you can see here a teamwork. Okay, today also, uh, when when we uh, go and minister in one place and people respond to the gospel, we don't just leave them there and say, oh, wow, you know, so many people have accepted uh, Christ, they are saved. Okay, now forget about it. No, but what do you see the early church do? You know, they sent the apostles. Why? Because now that there are a set of people who are believers, they need to be nurtured. They need to grow in God. So what are all the things that the leaders must do to equip the believers that is important so the early church did not abandon they could have said wow great samaria has received the word finished but they knew that the believers have to be discipled that's what jesus said in the great commission right and also baptizing them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit and teaching them all things that i have taught you so these people need to be discipled in Samaria. So it's like the birth, we saw the birth of a church in Jerusalem. Now the birth of the church in Samaria. It is born and it is being nurtured. Peter and John come and they minister to them the baptism in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not fallen on any of them. Okay. They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Again, it gives you clarity here. Water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. No? These are all separate things. And the church seems to have practiced preaching. Then once people get born again, water baptism. And then, you know, uh, at least here, it's like water baptism and then Holy Spirit baptism. In that order, it is taking place. And how did they minister the baptism in the Holy Spirit? By laying hands on them. And the people receive the Holy Spirit. So based on this, even today, when we pray for baptism in the Holy Spirit, what do we do? We go and we lay hands. So the Spirit of God, which is within a believer, which is within uh, us, right, who are already baptized in the Holy Spirit, when we lay our hands, the one who is, the one who wants to receive, Right? The Holy Spirit is uh, poured out on that person. So laying hands, from where did we learn this? Laying hands to pray for baptism in the Holy Spirit. From the book of Acts, we see that as a common practice. So they laid hands and when they prayed for the new believers, they received the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now all this is going on in Samaria. It's like, you know, sometimes... Um, there's a beautiful uh, uh, season, like in my life it has happened, like in my school days, college days and all, when um, uh, those days they used to have a lot of meetings where I, where I lived. So every other day there will be a poster, there is a gospel meeting, there is this, that. So we would go for all of those meetings and it was exciting. Okay, it was really exciting. So I'm imagining it would have been like that. So many people are hearing the gospel. Many people are giving their life to God. Every evening there is a, a meeting, there is worship, there is preaching, there is baptism in the Holy Spirit. Exciting times. And new ministers have come from the church uh, of Philip. You know, Peter, Pastor Peter, Pastor John, they've all come and they're also sharing. So it's a, it's like a thrilling time in Samaria and the whole city is in joy and there are miracles taking place in people's lives. Now, when all this is going on and also, um, you know, influential people like Simon, Simon is also Simon the sorcerer. He has also given his life to Christ. Now, you let us see how Simon observes and uh, reacts to what is going on. In verse 18, we read that Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. Okay, so he's observing what these men, they're laying their hands and then, uh, you know, the people are speaking in tongues, all this is going on. So he, remember, he also is a sorcerer. So he knew the spiritual realm a little bit, but the dark side of it. Okay, and based on his previous experience, he's saying, Okay, I will give you money. He tells this to, you know, the apostles. Give me this power also 
that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So he's calculating the way he used to do as a sorcerer and thinks that for some money, let me also buy this power and see how Peter responds. You know, Peter, by the Holy Spirit, obviously, okay, uh, uh, he he's responding each time. Earlier we saw uh, through the word of knowledge, you remember Ananias and Sapphira, they also uh, did not do the right thing. So Peter rebuked them. Now, Simon seems to come to that same place of receiving a rebuke from Peter. So when Simon says, I want to buy the Holy Spirit, I want to buy this power. When I lay hands, people should also receive the Holy Spirit. Peter gives him one nice rebuke and says, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Okay, so what is happening here? You know, uh, the motive of Simon's heart is not correct. He's not honoring the Holy Spirit as God. He's not honoring the work of the Spirit as the work of God. He thinks it's just some power that is being released and it can be purchased with money. So there is a dishonor okay, uh, that Peter is noticing. And that is why he scolds him. And what kind of uh, scolding? He says, like, you know, let your money perish with you. So it's like saying that Simon himself will face the consequences for what he is trying to do. And uh, uh, Peter points out, you know, the Holy Spirit, he is a gift from God. Money cannot buy the Holy Spirit. Today, for us in the church, we must remember this. Money cannot buy Holy Spirit. You know, money cannot buy the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes what believers think, ah, I will give more offering, then, you know, uh, somebody will minister to me with prophecy, somebody will minister to me with this and that. We think, yeah, through money, we can get it. But see what Peter is saying. Holy Spirit is a gift of God. How can you, how can you think you can purchase with money? So he says, Let you perish with your money. And then he gets, uh, you know, strongly he tells him, you neither have part nor portion in this matter. Because Peter recognizes, just like Ananias and Sapphira, how could you lie to the Holy Spirit, he asks them, right? Because you know, God gives the discernment. Now looking at Simon from outside, I don't think Peter would have known. But by the Holy Spirit, discerning of spirits, Peter realized this man's heart is not correct. Something is wrong. Something is wrong with this individual. So he says, your heart is not right in the sight of God. So when somebody's heart is not right, what should they do? They must repent. They must have a change of heart. Because uh, it's only when we are willing to change our attitude that God can you know, come back and minister uh, into our lives. But otherwise, you know, if we continue in this case, it seems more like, you know, pride, it seems like arrogance. Uh, when we are in that place, even if God wants to minister, it will not reach the heart of the person. And that's the reason. You know, Peter recognizes, oh, heart is in a bad condition. So he calls Simon to repentance and says, you repent, repent therefore of this wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So it's a wicked thought to dishonor the Holy Spirit and to think that money can buy the Holy Spirit or the works of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And uh, uh, so he says, come on, this is serious. You need to say sorry to God and change your heart attitude. And then, you know, uh, Peter also tells him, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. So the heart condition of Simon okay, uh, 
was not good bitterness bound by iniquity all the shows you know pride it shows the wrong attitude that simon was carrying so a believer with a wrong attitude in the church you see uh, that might cause us to do the wrong things and so how is peter dealing with a believer with a wrong attitude he is saying repent there needs to be a change of motives change of heart change of intentions because without that you know you cannot fully experience the kingdom of god and is it possible for a uh, believer to become like this you know we have talked about this when we studied 1 john yes it is very much possible believers are born again believers are uh, you know um, new creation in christ everything has become new all that is true but if we are not careful even believers can carry wickedness in our hearts you know you have ananias sapphira now you have simon these are all people example so i don't know i don't know how they started out maybe they started out very pure hearted uh, and what made them to come to this place of uh, greed of pride of bitterness he says poisoned by bitterness bound by iniquity meaning there is evil in your heart how did that happen to them we don't know but when god convicts us and says hey your heart is not right what should we do we must repent okay so that is the best way to respond and peter knew that so he in fact thank god you know simon didn't die he didn't fall and die like ananias and sapphira he had an opportunity to change himself so that you know he can continue and he can experience god the way the apostles were experiencing the way philip was experiencing so you a good heart see a believer that spiritual life of the believer right uh in christ jesus experiencing everything all that is wonderful but along with that maintaining a good heart all through your journey is very precious okay if at all we notice oh i am carrying some pride i am carrying some anger i am carrying things of the flesh the moment we recognize it the way peter told simon repent therefore you know and here the kind of wickedness that simon displayed is dangerous very very serious because he is trying to buy the holy spirit so that's why peter gets very angry he says you know you repent before god it's so bad the your thought itself is so bad i hope that when you pray and you ask for forgiveness i hope god forgives you he puts it like that you are poisoned poisoned and bound by iniquity so believers have to be careful uh and let's see how simon responds so simon answers him back and says pray to the lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me so when they had testified and preached the word of the lord they returned to jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the samaritans so simon uh instead of he personally repenting he is asking for the preacher to pray for him ah uh, now is this okay or not okay no maybe it's okay because it shows that he is starting to humble his heart before the lord so it begins there uh and we don't read about simon later okay uh, in this passage so did simon repent fully or did he not repent we don't know exactly what happened to simon the sorcerer but at least his response shows that what peter said was working in his heart okay hopefully now he uh, uh, came around and he said sorry to god and he changed his heart attitude okay so uh, that that is what happened to simon the sorcerer uh, and uh, we we notice here that um, mm, the word continued to be preached ministered to and 
once this was done it says they return to jerusalem so people who are ministering like peter john uh, and i think okay yeah peter and john uh, return back to jerusalem uh, preaching the gospel in many villages of the samaritans all right so uh, there must have been when you say samaria there must have been lots of communities so they ministered everywhere and then they kind of went back to jerusalem so let me just stop here we have a few minutes so if you want to uh, share your thoughts so you have any comments uh, i think you could uh, talk about that and then we will come back and continue with the rest of the chapter so what did you see what did you learn from uh, you know Pete, philip going and ministering in samaria and also the life of simon the sorcerer the way he responds Are you all with me? Okay, great, 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 great. You're understanding. That's good. That's good. So, uh, yeah, I think you're noticing the gospel is going out. All kinds of people are responding. And how does the church uh, take up new communities that are responding? Church is caring. Church wants the the apostles are wanting to build up these new communities, so they travel all the way from Jerusalem and they minister there. So you see all these, you know, ways of uh, uh, extending God's kingdom that is happening in the early church. All right. So uh, any any thoughts about Simon, Simon the sorcerer, Simon? You want to call him the magician? Okay, so what we'll do is, uh, let's just go ahead for a break. I know it's uh, 9.48 now. We will come back uh, at uh, 9.58. All right, so let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back and we can continue from where we have stopped. Okay, thank you.